All right, hello everyone. Um, my name is Julie Wertheimer. I am the outgoing law liaison for the APLS Student Committee. So thank you all so much for joining us um, for this Qualified Immunity and Psychology webinar. Um, the incoming chair, uh, Emma, Emma Marshall, and I have put together this webinar this webinar that we hope will become a future series designed to highlight the intersection of psychology and law in some of those um, understudied but still extremely relevant areas of law. So our hope for this webinar is that you'll walk away with a broader um, understanding of qualified immunity as a legal doctrine, as well as a sense of the role psychologists can play in studying qualified immunity. So to that end, I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our panel of distinguished speakers. And I'm so excited that they were all able to join us today to help us engage in a really interesting um, and important conversation. So Scott Michaelman is the legal director of the ACLU of DC, as well as the Shikes Fellow in Civil Liberties and Civil Rights and Lecturer on Law at Harvard Law School, where he teaches civil rights litigation. He has litigated a broad range of civil rights and civil, civil liberties issues, including access to the courts, discrimination and selective enforcement, freedom of speech and press, sentencing law, and unreasonable search and seizure. Mr. Michaelman has argued before the United States Supreme Court, six federal court of appeals, the Supreme Judicial Court of Massachusetts, and a number of other federal and state courts around the country. In connection with his practice, Mr. Michaelman has been quoted by national radio, television, and print media outlets, including NPR, CNN, Al Jazeera, The New York Times, Washington Post, and The New Yorker. Um, Mr. Michaelman is also the author of the textbook, Civil Rights Enforcement, and he has published numerous law review articles in top tier, law, in top -tier journals, such as the Notre Dame Law Review and the UCLA Law Review. Matthew Barge is a principal consultant at 21CP Solutions, and he is a police practices and civil rights expert with more than 15 years of experience working with law enforcement agencies, city government, and communities on public safety challenges. Uh, from 2015 through 2019, he served as the federal court court appointed monitor overseeing a federal consent decree involving the police in Cleveland, Ohio. He also served as lead police practices expert as a retired federal judge or to a retired federal judge overseeing an agreement between the city of Chicago and the ACLU addressing issues related to stop and frisk policies. He is also a senior consultant with the policing project at NYU School of Law. And Mr. Barge has engaged in significant assessment and implementation projects for departments and communities in Arizona, California, Colorado, New Mexico, New York, and Oregon. He has conducted exhaustive, exhaustive reviews of high profile use of force incidents for UCLA and the Los Angeles Unified School District and made recommendations for improving policy and procedure in each case. Uh, Dr. Jessica Brigant is the Jerome Hall Postdoctoral Fellow at the Indiana University Mauer School of Law. Dr. Brigant received her JD from the University of Illinois College of Law and her PhD from the University of Chicago Joint Program in Business and Psychology. Dr. Brigant has worked in a variety of governmental and legal settings, including the National Transportation Safety Board, the Champaign County Public Defender's Office, and the UK House of Commons. After law school, she clerked for Chief Justice Rita B. Garman of the Illinois Supreme Court, and she spent two years as a research fellow at the Illinois Program on Law, Behavior, and Social Science. Her research incorporates a wide variety of cross-disciplinary viewpoints borrowing from law, business, social psychology, and developmental psychology. Her current projects are primarily focused on intuitive legal judgments and especially judgments about punishment attitudes uh, towards punishments. And then finally, our conversation today will be moderated by Dr. Barbara O'Brien. Dr. O'Brien is a professor at the Michigan State uh, University College of Law, where she teaches classes in criminal law and procedure. She is currently the editor of the National Registry of Exonerations, um, 
and she received her JD from the University of Colorado and her PhD in social psychology from the University of Michigan. Her scholarship applies empirical methodology to legal issues, such as identifying predictors of false convictions and understanding prosecutorial decision-making. Her most recent work examines the persistent role of race in jury selection and in charging and sentencing decisions related to capital punishment. Uh, we are so honored and grateful that this amazing panel of speakers agreed to spend an hour with us today talking about the intersection of uh, qualified immunity and psychology. So just for a quick overview, today's conversation will start with a basic overview of the legal doctrine of qualified immunity. Uh, we will then discuss the intersection of psychology and qualified immunity law, and then discuss the current calls for qualified immunity reforms. There will be time at the end for our speakers to answer live questions, so please submit your questions via the chat box throughout the webinar, and Dr. O'Brien and myself will monitor those questions as they come in. Um, so now I'm going to turn it over to you, Dr. O'Brien, and our wonderful speakers. Thank you so much, Julie. Uh, I'm very excited to be part of this conversation. This is an incredibly hot and important issue. It's hot now, but it's one that um, a lot of scholars have been um, clamoring for change in this uh, in this doctrine for a long time. So uh, I would like to start uh, by asking Scott if you could just sort of give us a layman's overview of what qualified immunity is and what its origins are and how it works in the courts today. Sure, and thank you uh, for inviting me to to speak today and and honored to be a part of this discussion. The origins of qualified immunity are, are actually curious and almost accidental. The major federal statute providing for the enforcement of constitutional rights was passed in 1871 in the Reconstruction era when there was state-sanctioned and private violence uh, rampant, in particular throughout the South, against newly freed, formerly enslaved individuals and their supporters. So in 1871, Congress passed what was that what was then known as the Ku Klux Klan Act, and one of those one of the provisions of that law provided a federal cause of action to enforce constitutional rights against government officials who violated them. Now, this law did not get a lot of use in its first century, um, in part because uh, the scope of constitutional rights was not very broad. Uh, it, they were not yet recognized to apply to state as well as federal governments. And because many of the people who needed the most were intimidated out of exercising them or didn't have access to lawyers or the courts. But in the civil rights era, in the, in the modern era, the uh, Supreme Court revitalized this law, um, now known as Section 1983, after the chapter and and section of the U.S. Code in which it appears, um, and started allowing plaintiffs to use it to pursue uh, accountability for constitutional violations. It was cited in the desegregation cases, uh, including the original complaint in Brown versus Board of Education, and came to be uh, really a mainstay of federal civil rights practice. But at the same time, the court was confronting claims by officers that it wasn't quite fair as the scope of constitutional rights was expanding, that they should be held accountable for violations that they could not have predicted if they were relying in good faith on the law as it stood. And so in 1967, the court engrafted onto Section 1983 something that the Reconstruction Era Congress didn't put there. That is this defense that was later to become known as qualified immunity. At the time, the defense provided that a government official would not be liable for a constitutional violation if he was both acting in good faith and had probable cause for his actions, or, or as it broadened to become known, that, that the actions were objectively reasonable. And as the test evolved, uh, the good faith part of it was, was stripped away. And so today, under qualified immunity, government actors are not liable for constitutional violations if the right they violated was not clearly established at the time they violated it. Now, this is an incredibly powerful defense because what it means is if 
and the way the Supreme Court and, and other courts have interpreted interpreted the idea of clearly established, what it means is if a government official violates the Constitution in a way that has not yet been held unconstitutional, the government actor is immune. That's remarkable. It means that we are telling the government officials that they can violate the Constitution as long as they don't do it in a way that's been done before, in a way that should have been obvious to them. It means they get a safe harbor for violating the Constitution. It means that when, even as we tell other people in our society that ignorance of the law is no excuse, ignorance of the law is an excuse for government officials, the ones charged with upholding and enforcing the laws, if they violate the Constitution, our most fundamental law, which which seems to uh, to many of us quite quite backwards, and uh, and and I'll I'll say one more thing about about the doctrine of, of of qualified immunity, and that is, if a government official asserts it in court and loses, he gets an immediate appeal, which is very unusual in the law, and so it means that before a plaintiff can proceed with a case, the government official gets. Uh, gets an early chance to dismiss it on the basis of this immunity. And then if he fails, gets to appeal. So he gets two shots at getting the case thrown out right at the outset on the ground that this type of violation had never been uh, uh, recognized before. And so even if it was a violation, who cares? I'm immune. So um, if how precisely does it have to track prior case law? So if I do something that, uh, if I'm an officer and I do something that violates the constitution and it's like something that a court has held violates the constitution before, but it's not exactly, so it's not on all fours, it's analogous. Like how narrowly do courts interpret interpret that to, to, when they're looking at prior precedent to see if something is clearly established? This has been a real flashpoint for debate over the previous several decades. One of the problems is that courts differ in how precisely they require that prior case to be factually similar to uh, to the, the current case in which the officer claims immunity. Um, the Supreme Court has sent mixed signals, but recently has been sending a clear signal that courts have to look at it at a very specific level of generality, which means if exactly the same thing didn't happen, the officer is immune. And, and let me give you an example of a way in, in which that played out in one of our cases. We, um, we represented a man named Alex Baxter, who was a homeless man who was pursued by the police one winter night in Nashville, Tennessee in 2014, suspected of uh, residential burglaries. He fled into the basement of a house and two officers, one of them with a canine, cornered him there. He surrendered to the officers by sitting down on the ground and putting his hands up. Nonetheless, after a short while passed, one of the officers unleashed the dog that attacked Mr. Baxter, wounding him under his armpit, because remember his arms are up, uh, creating a deep puncture wound that required emergency medical treatment. Um, Mr. Baxter, initially sued representing himself and qualified immunity was initially denied. Uh, it was denied because in that same court uh, or in the, in the appeals court uh, governing the court in which he sued, there had been a prior case a couple of years before this incident in which it had been established that it was unconstitutional for cops to sick a dog on a man who surrendered to the cops by lying down on the ground. So man prone on ground, unarmed, can't just attack him with a dog. Seems pretty obvious, but they had to say it in, in 2012 and they held that was unconstitutional. When Mr. Baxter started his case, the court said no qualified immunity. That prior case, which was called Campbell, the lying down case establishes you also can't attack a man who has surrendered and is unarmed by sitting down with his hands up. And the court of appeals affirmed and said, right, no qualified immunity. So they, they kept litigating. Uh, Mr. Baxter still proceeding uh, pro se, representing himself. Um, and the officers, as they're allowed to do, saw qualified immunity again. Again, the district court denied it, went up to the Court of Appeals. But this time they drew a different panel of judges. And a different panel of judges said, no, 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 that prior case, Campbell about the guy who was lying down, 
that's not the same at all. This is a case about a man sitting down with his hands up, and that was a case about a man lying down, so it's different. Therefore, the law is not clearly established, the officers get immunity, and Mr. Baxter loses. It was at that point that the ACLU and the ACLU of DC and the ACLU of Tennessee all got involved in the case, asked the Supreme Court to review it, which they declined to do with one justice writing a spirited dissent suggesting that the time had come to revisit qualified immunity. But this is why, right? You can't get much more factually similar than attacking a man who surrendered by lying down and attacking a man who surrendered by sitting down with his hands up. And if that distinction is meaningful, then we might as well just not enforce the constitution at all, because of course, every case is different in some, is different than all past cases in some minor way. Okay, so you have to be really squarely, almost identical facts, uh, at least with some courts. At that, least uh, with some courts. That, yeah. that is, I think that's one of the worst examples I've ever seen. Um, there are other cases, other decisions that are more lenient on that point. But one of the criticisms of qualified immunity is that in addition to undermining the rule of law and obstructing accountability for constitutional violations is that it's unpredictable arbitrariness ensues when different panels apply the rule differently. Do, um, d does the, the process by which someone can have a case dismissed uh, on the basis of qualified immunity, does that come after there's some discovery allowed or is this all pre-discovery? And for those of you who, who you know, who, who, who are not familiar with the term discovery is when uh, during litigation, you're entitled to, to various pieces of evidence from the other side and to depose witnesses and to get them on, um, basically to help you start to build your case. Are you entitled to discovery before the ruling on qualified immunity? Uh, the answer is the defendants can move to dismiss on the basis of qualified immunity before discovery, and they can also seek what's called summary judgment, um, which is a, a fancy way of saying I win. Um, a, a motion to to say I win uh, on the basis of qualified immunity after discovery, and they can even assert it yet again at trial. So the Supreme Court has set up a system where defendants get to have this really powerful defense. They can assert it early and often. They can assert it repeatedly, and if they lose it, they can go straight up to the Court of Appeals, which we usually don't allow. We usually require litigants to wait until the end to, to raise all the appeals they want. Um, and so defendants have the deck stacked in their favor in constitutional litigation. And that, that affects not only whether the defendant's going to win the case, but the incentives on the plaintiffs to settle. Because if the, uh, even if the defendant doesn't win, the plaintiff's got to wait potentially a while while they adjudicate qualified immunity. It goes up to the Court of Appeals. They make another decision. It comes back down. They, they have discovery. They do qualified immunity. Again, it goes back up to the Court of Appeals, which is, again, all of which happened in Mr. Baxter's case, Mr. Baxter's case about an event in 2014. And he didn't finally resolve qualified immunity until uh, the Supreme Court denied cert earlier this year. And if we'd won, he would have gotten finally to go to trial, you know, and this is what, six years later. Um, I have one more question about the process of it before we start talking about the policy. Um, are the decisions that find that, are the decisions that either grant or support dismissal on the basis of qualified immunity, do the courts in those instances resolve the question of whether or not the act was unconstitutional so that at least a future plaintiff could say in this decision, so for instance, Mr. Baxter's decision, um, the next time something similar happens, uh, can then that future litigant say in Mr. Baxter's case, there was qualified immunity, but the court then recognized the unconstitutionality of it, or is it of no value in the future? A very important question. And the answer is the Supreme Court held, has held that each court can decide for itself. So oh. in Mr. Baxter's case, the second Court of Appeals, the one that said there was immunity and that ended ended up ending the case, did not say this was unconstitutional, but there's immunity. It just said there's immunity. We're not going to decide whether it was an unconstitutional. So if, ex ex if the exact same thing happened again, they could grant qualified immunity again. Now they have discretion to say, yes, it was unconstitutional, but there's immunity, but they didn't. And because of that discretion, there are a bunch of cases where you would want the court at least to announce the law 
at least to create the body of precedent necessary to show that the law was clearly established the next time. But they don't have to do that. As Justice Stevens wrote famously in a dissent about 20 years ago, the doctrine of qualified immunity essentially gives the officers one free violation of the Constitution every time they do something new or not obvious. And now with courts having discretion whether to declare the law or not in the process of granting qualified immunity, there is no limit to the number of free violations. It's not one free violation. It's however many violations happen until uh, a court has opined on that precise set of facts. Okay. So um, that makes me then wonder about the arguments about continuing this doctrine, because it doesn't sound like it has a lot going for it. And I would like to ask you, Matthew, what do you, um, what what would you say are the biggest policy concerns on both sides of this issue, both the calls to, um, you know, either abolish qualified immunity or, or really restrict its application and those that argue that we should maintain it? Um, and what do you think it is about um, that makes, well, I, I mean, is there anything, I mean, there's there's all the, the, the protests and the calls for police reform, but, you know, is there anything else about this particular moment you think that makes this issue particularly resonate? Well, I think um, uh, those are good questions. I think that the doctrine of qualified immunity probably makes more sense if you think about it as applied to a uh, you know, a, a desk worker at a municipal agency, a parks and recreation worker, right? Or um, or an IRS uh, auditor or something. Um, it may make more sense uh, where the, uh, the set of things that the official is encountering is just a, a lot more circumscribed based on the nature and the manner of their work. Police officers, as Scott alluded to, uh, they see something new every day. They have to respond and react to an infinitely uh, broad and complex array of things in the world. As someone who has reviewed countless you know, use of force incidents and officer misconduct case files, you are routinely surprised and amazed at the situations in which people find themselves in that officers need to respond to. And so you know, even if the doctrine was working uh, in a manner where uh, officers were uh, really police officers had maybe only one or fewer than one sort of free constitutional violations. Uh, if you if you define uh, uh, the scope of the violation in a very narrow way, uh, just the nature of the world is such that um, uh, you know there will always be new and, and novel sort of uh, sort of uh, situations. So I think. Um, uh, that's a roundabout way of saying, I don't think qualified immunity works in the police context full stop. And that's why very diverse coalition at this point uh, from more conservative leaning folks at the Cato Institute to uh, folks in the Black Lives Matter movement for different reasons have coalesced around, um, you know, this sense that qualified immunity is giving government actors way too much leeway and way too little accountability with respect to constitutional violations. So I think in this particular moment, uh, as, um, uh, as activists uh, and, and concerned residents across the country have um, tuned in after George Floyd um, to evaluate, well, what is it that is preventing long-term accountability of, of, of the police? Um, they are, I, I think, uh, zooming in on since the the criminal laws are, are not uh, uh, usually uh, something that has historically been been um, very uh, utilized in, in keeping uh, officers accountable. Put it another way, up to this point in American history, it's been the rare exception that a police officer is prosecuted criminally uh, for um, for things that they do in their official capacity. Um, what we're talking about with respect to qualified immunity is, is, is you know, generally speaking, a more of a, uh, you know, holding uh, people, uh, holding officers accountable, government officials uh, accountable uh, uh, in, in sort of the civil sphere. Um, you know, uh, w w how, how can we make that uh, more, more possible? How can, 
how can officers, regardless of whether individual prosecutors and individual jurisdictions want to pursue charges or not, how can we uh, try to ensure that uh, individuals who are affected or the families of individuals who have been killed by police can still pursue actions that might foster long-term accountability. Um, and the last thing I would say, just, you know, so to underscore it, um, you know, every time that an officer does something where they should have been held accountable, where there's, where there should have been the ability um, of an action to go through uh, and for a court or a jury to find that um, a police officer's um, uh, activity and performance was unconstitutional. Uh, quite typically, uh, the manner of, of recourse there, the the you know what 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 you get if you win is money from the from the local jurisdiction. And you know we know in sort of countless other areas of American life that um, needing to pay a series of large judgment from the city coffers. Um, is one way or the other, whether it's coming directly from a city's operating funds or whether their insurance carrier has to foot the bill, and that's uh, greatly increasing the cost of coverage for that jurisdiction. One way or the other, it can drive incentives for a local jurisdiction who's been asleep at the wheel to pay much more attention to the policies, the training, um, all of the day-to-day -day activities of a police department that can really drive a um, a front end difference in how um, in how uh, policing happens um, in the 18,000 jurisdictions, uh, the law enforcement agencies that we have in this country. Right. And it, it um, certainly doesn't help that the few what the, the few instances where there is a payoff, it's so a payout, it's so often a sealed settlement that, you know, in terms of further accountability, it's uh, that seems a little counterproductive. Um, so I'd like to, I think, thank you. That was a, um, a really good background on the, the, the legal doctrine around this. And um, so sort of moving on now to the intersection of law and psychology, um, I, I um, have a question for you, Jessica. And that, that's, you know, the, the doctrine of qualified immunity is in part depend in part depends on some assumptions about human behavior and cognition. Um, and do you think that there's an empirical basis for any of these assumptions? And uh, to what extent might empirical, um, namely psychological research, further our uh, understanding or understanding of how we might improve uh, the qualified immunity doctrine? Yeah. So <clears throat> I think there are a lot of different aspects of psychology and decision making and behavior that underlie all of this discussion, right? So um, when we're talking about the policy behind qualified immunity, this sort of big assumption that we're making is that, and by we, I mean the courts, right? The, the big assumption that courts are making is that if we don't do something to stop everyone from suing the police or whoever we're talking about, um, we will continue to sue the police at every possible juncture and ultimately that will deter people from signing up to become police officers or other public officials and it will deter police officers from doing their job in some meaningful way right so i think one of the biggest questions underlying all of this is a question about deterrence and we know empirically uh that there's very little empirical evidence of deterrence in basically any domain. Uh, there's no direct evidence on uh, qualified immunity that I know of, um, but there is a lot of evidence looking at this sort of um, civil tort liability uh, in other er or other arenas, right? So um, doctors, for example, right? Doctors who mess up can be sued by their patients for damages, right? And medical malpractice has become you know, less of an issue in the last few years, but over the last 20 or 30 years, there've been a lot of discussion about the effects of medical malpractice lawsuits. And they have a lot of the same threads as this qualified immunity discussion, right? They're talk we're talking about, you know, are doctors taking on fewer patients? Are they making, you know, less uh, of the necessary but risky decisions? Um, are they deterred from um, practicing at all, right? Um, and on the flip side, does civil liability seem to have any um, any useful reining in function, right, on 
doctors on sort of rogue doctors, right? Does does malpractice even work as a um, way to help protect patients? And on that, again, <laughs> there's a lot of mixed evidence. We know that um, doctors systematically overestimate the likelihood that they're going to be sued for malpractice. Um, we can imagine, and I think you see a lot of this happening right now, um, something similar going on with respect to police officers and police officer right, and uh, police unions and the estimating of sort of how likely they are to be sued if qualified immunity is substantially changed or, or pulled away altogether. Um, we see, right, less evidence. There's some been some empirical work in uh, auto liability, right? So um, when various states changed their um, car insurance policies so that um, the fault of the individual driver who caused the accident wasn't as important, um, there was some evidence, but it was very weak, that people got in more accidents, right? So the same sort of, right, if you just let people, um, the argument going, right, if you take away the ability to just pick on, to pick the one specific person at fault and sue them, uh, it will make people drive, um, you know, much more recklessly in the same, that, right, it's another analogous argument. So we can look at, you know, does taking away the ability for um, uh, being able to sue a specific police officer make them more reckless? Um, we don't know, but we can look at these other sorts of analogous situations. Um, I think there's also some really interesting um, sort of psychological and behavioral economics uh, decision architecture here, right? Mm -hmm. So uh, both Scott and Matthew have talked about all of the ways in which the system is set up intentionally and otherwise to make it very, very, very difficult for a plaintiff to get their case even heard, let alone to get any sort of damages or restitution. And, you know, what it, what we have is a system that has set up hurdles for the plaintiff. It's set up um, greasing, right, sort of greasing the axles for the defense. Um, it's made options for the court to take it, right, so courts can take the sort of easier option of just saying, we don't need to rule on this constitutional question. We can just um, say that even if there was a constitutional violation, this would be, right, it wasn't clearly established law, so therefore qualified immunity applies, so therefore we don't have to address this thornier question. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of other layers, but um, I think those are the biggest sort of policy questions that we don't really have a lot of empirical evidence on. Right. Yeah, the, that, that's true. There's a lot. It's not just about deterring. I mean, there's a lot of different decision makers at play here. There's the officers, there's the potential plaintiffs, there are the judges who might punt an issue they otherwise wouldn't. Um, Scott, um, what do you think about um, what do you think about some of the things that Jessica said about uh, about sort of the misconceptions um, um or, or what do you think about some of the, the, the questions that have been raised here about uh, misconceptions about qualified immunity um, and officer liability? Well, one common misconception that is seen even in court decisions, remarkably even in decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court, is the notion that the officers are going to pay out of pocket. There's a big concern discussed in a lot of the cases that these officers will be, won't take the jobs, to begin with, they will be timid in the field because they know one wrong step and they're going bankrupt with large money judgments. But that's not true at all. Because as Professor Joanna Schwartz of UCLA has shown in more than 99% of instances of, of civil rights lawsuits, the officers are what's called indemnified, which means the their employer agrees to cover the judgment. And it's why they do that. They also don't want the officers to be, uh, they also want the officers to take the job and they don't want the officers to be excessively timid. They want to provide some protection. Um, so, so this isn't a real fear that the officers are going to go bankrupt. But if you treat it as it is, as if it were a major problem and, and generate immunity doctrine and, and strengthen immunity doctrine on that basis, what you end up with is a regime in which not only 
don't the officers go bankrupt, but nobody pays at all, which means first, there's no compensation for the victims of constitutional misconduct. And second, there's no incentive for anyone to do anything differently. Not the officer who, as we know, isn't going bankrupt, but doesn't even have to explain themselves to uh, maybe their employer who isn't so thrilled because they have to pay a judgment. Well, they're not paying a judgment. The, the officer is now immune. So the officer doesn't have to pay, neither does the municipality. To take it back uh, to, to an earlier point that Matthew raised, if the municipality is on the hook because there's a judgment against the officer and all the municipalities indemnify or the state government or the federal government indemnify, then they have to think about what, what are their, what's their training like? What's their supervision like? Are, is it time to fire a problem officer? Is it time to change the culture of a, a section or a unit that is behaving in, in a reckless way and disregarding constitutional rights? Those are decisions we want municipalities or, or some government actor to have to face because otherwise there's just no incentive for anyone to change at all. And, and when we think about what, what's going on in this moment, I think the lack of accountability for constitutional violations, including the over-policing of Black people in this country, directly contributes to this, this inertia in support of the status quo. Nobody, nobody changes because nobody has to change. Nobody's being asked to change. Nobody's being hit with money judgments. And when I mean nobody, no entity, no institution, no government, nobody is being told, you're going to pay for this thing that you're doing because you're violating people's rights. Well, not if they're not if everybody's immune and, and the plaintiff never wins. You know, and, I, and I think you touch on a very common misconception that even is broader than just about this, but just this, this notion that government actors who engage in misconduct will get fired, will get prosecuted, will be sued. Very rare. Um, and it's not just officers, it's you know prosecutors who, who have even greater immunity. Um, you know, um, we had a question in the chat about um, that uh, requiring paperwork after uh, every time an officer unholsters uh, their weapon. Um, is this a type of, and there's a question about whether this would be a deterrent to discharge or if in the moment, this is kind of the last thing on an officer's mind. And I was wondering if Matthew, you had thoughts on that. Yeah, I mean, the... Um uh, many of the federal consent decrees um, that are um, reform packages imposed where um, the Department of Justice, at least under the previous administration, had found a pattern and practice of unconstitutional policing, um, you know, that the, they, they've imposed reform packages. And this is a typical reform um, within that context, simply to have officers report when they unholster and point a firearm at an individual. Many courts have indicated that that is a seizure under the Constitution because an individual is, when you have a firearm pointed at you, feeling like you're not free to leave. Um, and so it's, in my view, it's a really common sense um, reform. There's not evidence from the jurisdictions to date um, that have implemented that reform that officers are any um, any more likely to be injured um, as a result, either overall or in use of force incidents. Um, you know, the, the fact of the matter is that, I think this goes directly to this qualified immunity discussion. Police departments don't make it easy, even with wide ranging discovery, um, uh, to understanding what it is their officers do every day in terms of collecting data, logging rigorous information about what officers are doing. Um, the nature of their performance in critical encounters. Um, you know, we often focus on on use of force um, situations, and rightly so, given the gravity of the constitutional and fundamental sanctity of human life issues that are implicated. But there are other constitutional protections that potentially this doctrine also shields, and other areas of the Fourth Amendment, like stops and searches and arrests. Um, most police departments across the country do not log uh, uh, in a systematic way um, how many people are stopped and what happens during that encounter. Um, major cities in the, across the country simply don't have systematic information um, about those types of encounters, which makes it problematic to try to stitch together after the fact if you're a police department or if you're an affected resident and want to pursue legal action, precisely precisely what, what happened. 
Um, so I think that there are a number of reforms within a police department um, that um, are important in driving kind of front end accountability, right? I mean, that's the other point I would make on this front, that there are things like qualified immunity that really deal with what happens after something goes wrong. What's the recourse at the back end? How do we hold officers accountable when they've done something wrong? That is is um, that has to be complement, complemented and supplemented by front end accountability. How can we prevent officers from ever doing something wrong in the first place? And as Scott was saying, there's this odd, very coherent system that we have in place where uh, nobody is inspired to do anything differently on the front end because nothing ever forces them on the back end to consider what they could do differently at the start to prevent things from going down that road again. And there, so there is this circular pattern. And I think the documentation of things like, uh, they were very fundamental, like when officers are unholstering and pointing their firearm at an individual, that makes sense to document because it can spur change at the outset, um, at least with respect to knowing more in the way of what officers are doing, but also you know elevating that as being a, the kind of significant encounter it is without necessarily chilling officers from doing what they need to do to keep themselves in the community safe. No, oh, right. Um, no, I think that 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 makes sense. And you know, there's different kinds of accountability. There's outcome accountability, accountability for a particular outcome, and then there's accountability for the process by which you follow. And um, they're not mutually exclusive. Um, Jessica, what do you think? I mean, from a psychologist's perspective, what do you think about the um, about that point about, you know, say requiring more formality, you know, more formal procedures following the unholstering of a weapon. Yeah. So I, I think one of the things that we know, right, in social psychology is that uh, people are really bad at predicting how they're going to feel, right, or what they're going to do in a situation when they're, um, when the situation is different than it is when they're making the prediction, right? So this is the classic sort of empathy gap research where, um, you know, I predict that I will be fine if I go to the grocery store while I'm hungry. Um, you know, I won't, of course I won't buy these things that I don't want, but, if, but then when I actually get there, right, I'm under this stress and I'm much more susceptible to that hunger, right? And that's a fairly trivial example, but it's a common and familiar one, I think. And the same thing is true when we start talking about, oh, you know, a police officer who might be in fear for his or her life uh, is going to be less likely to, to sort of do what they think is necessary and draw their weapon or whatever. Um, if they have this, if they're going to have to fill out a document afterwards, um, strikes me as the kind of exactly the kind of prediction that, you know, maybe that makes sense at the time, but if you're at right, if we start looking at what people are actually doing when they're under these stressful situations, my guess is, based on what we know about empathy gap research, my guess is that it's much less likely to be a relevant factor in their minds. Yeah. And um, I mean, and although I'm thinking about that, you know, that empathy gap in terms of where I feel like sometimes we overcorrect for it, where we say, well, if you're in this situation, you wouldn't even be able, you know, you're panicked, you can't think straight, you don't realize that they're just holding a water bottle and not a weapon. And Maybe we over comp, you know, we overcorrect for it sometimes. Um, what do you think in terms of if you were advising a young psych psychologist interested in psycholegal studies? What kinds of questions do you think would be relevant to inquiry uh, to inquire into uh, in terms of effective reforms? Because I do want to talk about uh, the reform movement. So I think, you know, I uh, am a sort of uh, psychology and law research evangelist, right? So I think um, one of the great things about the intersection of psychology and law, and, and especially in this kind of area, is that there are questions and tasks to be taken on no matter what your psychology or, or right, if you're a social scientist of some, right, a sociology and anthropology, whatever it is. Whatever your field is, whatever your sort of theoretical interest is, there are interesting and important questions that you can apply that to when we're talking about the law. And, and I think that applies especially in something like qualified immunity, right? So we've talked about a lot of questions that are sort of um, surface level in a psychological research sense, right, about this deterrent effect, right? What effect, you know, what kinds of effects does... 
the conversation that we're having about qualified immunity and about these reforms, what does that have on how um, state actors, police officers, um, municipal authorities, right, the sort of people to whom police officers are theoretically accountable, um, what effect does this discussion have on the way that they are thinking about the duties that they have to perform uh, as part of their jobs, right? That's a sort of simple place to start. But there's also, I think, with all of these reforms, there are questions about, um, you know, how does the way that police officers are held accountable or not, um, how does that affect the way that the general public thinks about the legitimacy of the criminal justice system broadly? We, there's a lot of research in procedural justice, right, that sort of that suggests that people are much more sensitive than we might think to the fairness of the process and the and and not just to the outcome, right? So, Barb, earlier you mentioned that sort of outcome uh, accountability versus process accountability, and it turns out people are quite sensitive to process. Um, so, there's a lot of questions about you know what is the effect of this kind of defense and particularly the way the defense is currently being implemented. Um, how does that affect people's view of the legitimacy of the system, of the procedural fairness of the system? But then there's, you know, as I said, you can get sort of more and more um, broad, right? There are broader questions here for anybody who has an interest in this kind of research. Right? There are questions about perception, right? So we know that perceptions are constructed. We know that even with police cam, right, with body cameras and other sorts of videos of these incidents, that people watching the same video can come to very different conclusions about what they just saw based on their pre-existing beliefs about what they were going to see. So there's interesting, there's right fruitful research to be had there. And how does that change the way that we think about police um, accountability? Uh, there, you know, if you're a person who's interested in persuasion, right, and communication, I think there's something really interesting to be looked at about, you know, how do we talk, right? There is, as uh, I think, uh, I think Matthew mentioned, right, there's this slightly odd looking coalition of people who support reforming qualified immunity. And there's a question there about, you know, sort of messaging or marketing. There's a question there about what brings groups with otherwise um, incompatible viewpoints together on an issue. Um, you know, there's a lot here. And I think, you know, I, this is now I'm getting a little bit into my like, wouldn't, wouldn't it be great if, but I think, right, there's a lot of potentially really valuable research that could be done. Um, and wouldn't it be great if we could get courts and policymakers to listen to it? Yeah, I mean, I'm thinking about some of the work that's been done on, say, changing attitudes about the death penalty in the recent in recent decades. And, um, and I do think that 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 would be some interesting work that could be done, too, and people's ideas. I mean, sort of this perception of, you know, anybody can sue for anything and get a million dollars versus the reality. Um, and to the extent that current events are making that seem like kind of challenging that view um, by bringing these issues up, up to the front, um, I think that would be really, really interesting. Um, I don't know if we wanted to leave time for questions or if we should just keep going. Um, I just, uh, I don't want to hijack uh, or, or, you know, yeah, keep people from asking questions that they want to ask. Um, because I, I did want to talk a little bit about what re reform would look like. Um, and um, what do you think, and, and, you know, this is a question for actually any of the panelists who want to chime in, what would, what would reform look like? Um, I mean, there's straight up abolition of qualified immunity, but there might be also intermediate steps or something else, uh, maybe keeping qualified immunity, but having it be much more narrowly interpreted so that it would, you know, it really was a novel issue of first impression about the search and seizure law that that, that the cop would have qualified immunity, but not if he sicks a dog on a person who's on his knees with his hands up. Um, what do you think would be, and I'll just ask each of you, what do you think that reform might look like um, if, if, you know, if you were, if, if some lawmaker was asking you what you would like to do to change it, what, what would you say? And I'll, and I'll start, uh, I'll start with you, Matthew. Yeah, I, I you know, I think, um, 
there are some people who are simply, as you as you uh, mentioned, just calling for the outright abolition of 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 the doctrine. And as Scott noted earlier, I mean, the do- the doctrine is judicially invented, and so uh, you know, it's it's not. Um, there, there's no clear reason to me why that isn't a, a, a valid potential option. Um, we can invent something else given the failure of the doctrine in many different regards, I think. There are some others who indicate that the doctrine could be replaced um, and sort of um, reference what was more or less um the judicial standard before qualified immunity, which sort of gave government officials some defenses, um, uh, really more, I mean, this is a gross oversimplification and Scott may be be able to put more, more details on this, but essentially a reasonableness defense that I, you know, that, that a reasonable person under these circumstances, um, you know, would, you know, would have or should have known that, um, uh, the activity was um, a constitutional violation. That has perhaps some appeal in some regards and perhaps less appeal in others. Reasonableness and that concept is something that has not been a terribly successful one in many other areas of police um, behavior. Um, you know, it's, the, it's a key concept with respect to the Fourth Amendment and use of force and stop searches and arrests. And, and it, it, it has its own separate sort of problems. Um, but I think it also, it's, you know, it's, there's an, there's an underlying concern that I don't really have an answer here. And I think it's why there needs to continue to be a lot of active discussion there is a sense that you don't want to disincentivize not just people from becoming police officers, but people from engaging in public service and going into government. If doing mm-hmm. so is going to expose you, since government positions are not generally excessively high, pay, uh, high paying, if doing that is going to expose you to just a lot more aggravation, if not economic consequences, um, you know, it just may be the rational thing to find other ways of service that aren't in the government. And I worry that if there isn't some good faith type of defense that um, an individual can provide when it's appropriate, um, that that there might be, you know, that, that good people might not be inclined to enter the policing profession or government service. And from what I see day to day in you know, departments across the country, we need all the good people that we can get. So I, I, I'm not exactly sure what the answer is. Um, I'm, I, I'm you know, sort of personally very, uh, I, I'm, I'm, just, I'm, I'm a critic of the doctrine full stop. Um, I think that um, whatever we do needs to make sure that there is an ability in some limited circumstances for people to really assert, um, you know, when something happened, they did their best and, you know, what they did, um, uh, uh, you know, had ramifications that were, that, that were unconstitutional. But I think that's a much more narrow universe of instances than where this doctrine is successfully asserted, uh, uh, now and I, Scott, you may be itching to get in here um, yeah. on that point. Yeah. What do you think, Scott? Yeah. So, so um, you know, maybe in, in in the interest of of uh, preventing the panel from from just becoming a, 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 an echo chamber about how we all dislike qualified immunity, I'm I, I want to push back against some of the things that 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 Matthew said because I think um, I I don't think there's any danger in deterring people from getting into government service because of this risk in terms of them actually facing this risk. Now, maybe that's a place for Jessica's research to go in terms of why do they think this risk exists if they're always indemnified. But if the problem is we're going to, uh, we're worried that people will be excessively timid, they won't go into government service at all, the answer is to be more transparent about it. Forget qualified immunity. If that's the problem, we need to institute direct what's called respondeat superior liability, which is where the employer is strictly liable for the constitutional violations of its employees. That would replicate the indemnification system, but make it a lot more obvious and well known to people. So, you know, to make to make that very concrete, if a DC police officer violates your rights, 
okay, don't sue the officer, sue the District of Columbia, make it clear in the law that the District of Columbia can be sued if that person violated their rights. And there doesn't have to be some kind of heightened showing. And for those of you lawyers out there, I'm talking about the Monell policy or custom rule. And for those of you non-lawyers out there, you can just take it that, that there's a heightened showing that, uh, that makes it very hard to sue the government as opposed to the individual. But if you take the individual's, uh, if you leave the individual's defenses where they are, but take away the government's defenses or attack, let's say, sovereign immunity, um, for for state governments, then you make it possible to get accountability against the government and and just completely take off the table the question of whether some some employee is going to pay. Um, I'll say also that in terms of reform proposals short of um, of complete abolition of qualified immunity, I think the most promising alternatives that I've seen do get into shifting the liability from Govern from from individuals to government, not finding different ways to limit liability, replacing one what what I think of as a denigration of accountability and the rule of law with a different, slightly less problematic one. Jessica, do you have any thoughts? I want to make I sure. Mean, I think, yeah, uh, just briefly, right? I think because I I think uh, you have. B2 experts here already. Um, but I will say, right, that, you know, this is the kind of question that you see come up a lot in the law where courts struggle to, you know, with one with a with a problem that seems too difficult. Um, and the answer is, I think, right, that we have found other, we've found ways to solve this very problem in other contexts, right? So we find other ways for uh, doctors, for example, right? I mentioned, I talked about medical malpractice earlier, right? Doctors and lawyers um, both are, right, prone to committing mistakes, um, both, right? Both in sort of good faith attempts to do the best they can, and also, um, you know, for less beneficent reasons. Uh, and we, you know, we have a system in place then it may, you know, it itself isn't perfect, but we have a system in place that's designed to deal with what happens when uh, an individual with a high stakes job makes a serious mistake. And how do, you know, all of these questions about how could we possibly pull these things apart? What kinds of, um, you know, what kinds of incentives are we creating for people who might be going into this? What, you know, who ultimately is going to pay? Um, all of those things are questions that, a, we need more research on in this context, but B, the start of that research is out there in contexts like car insurance, in medical malpractice, in lawyer law malpractice, in workers' compensation, right? We have means of products liability, right? We have means of talking about these things. Yeah, we have workers' comp, we have, yeah. We have dealt with this. Um, so there was a question in the chat about the means of how reform would be implemented, um, it, you know, just sort of logistically how that would happen. Scott, can you can you enlighten us? Sure, just just very quickly because I know we, we are close to time. Um, either the Supreme Court or Congress could fix it. This is not a constitutional doctrine that requires a constitutional amendment. It is something that the Supreme Court can say, whoops, we went too far, we made up this doctrine, it wasn't supposed to be there, or Congress could amend the statute to say, you know that doctrine that the Supreme Court put in? It's it's done, mm -hmm. we're done with that. Um, we're, we're gonna make that clear. And and there are efforts in Congress right now to, to do that and and that the ACLU is, is supportive of. I'm sure police unions have some things to say. Right. Heavily debated. Yeah. So I, I, I think that we're out of, time, Julie. I don't want to cut anyone off, but I also don't mm -hmm. want to. Yeah, I think that over. brings us um, to the end of our webinar. So thank you all so much to our attendees um, who joined us for this conversation and to our speakers. Um, it was really interesting, really insightful. I think I know that I personally um, took a lot out of this conversation. Um, so I hope our student members at um, APLS did as well. Um, so I think uh, Victoria, who is our chair, is going to go ahead and end the webinar.
Um, and I think that is going to kick out all of the participants. So, um, oh, okay, thank you. <laughs> um, so I just wanted to say, um, uh, yeah, thank you so much to the speakers. Um, Victoria, are we still on air? Yeah. Um, I think we're good to be off of air now. So thank you to all of our attendees. Um, and feel free to reach out to APLS if you have any questions. Thanks so much. I really enjoyed this. Thank you. Yeah, Pleasure. thank you so much. Bye.